Running out of money chronically is, is tough. You're employing people and you've got about three months of, you know, cash runway. Naivety and delusion are two helpful things as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you are interested in starting a company, the biggest challenge is getting started, I think. Hey guys, it's Charles and welcome to Chat GCP, a medical science, clinical research and commercialization podcast. On today's episode, we have a special guest from Aroa Biosurgery, their CEO, Dr. Brian Ward. Aroa Biosurgery are a New Zealand-based and ASX-listed company developing novel solutions for wound care and healing and soft tissue repair. Welcome to the podcast, Brian. Great to have you. Great. Thank you for having me here. Awesome. <coughs> um, not to get too deep too quickly, but uh, what... Um, being a CEO of a company such as Aroa Biosurgery, you're obviously driv massively driven by something or you're on a big bit of a mission. Zooming out, what is the mission that you're on and what do we need to know about you and your upbringing to better understand that mission? Yeah, so for me, I mean, I, I've um, professionally been interested in, uh, you know, a career in, in kind of biological sciences and, you know, I, I trained as a vet um, you know, got into clinical practice and, you know, discovered the kind of med tech pharma world as part of that. So, you know, I've always wanted to, always enjoyed a job where I've, um, it's been interesting, it's been, I've learnt new things, um, it's been um, something that uh, is kind of creative and, um, you know, where it's sort of had, not only I could do well on it, but also it had some broader um, benefit for other people as well. And I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, I've been lucky enough to kind of be able to bring those those two things together. And then, you know, building a company is a lot of fun as well. So yeah. being able to do that and build a company, um, yeah. that's 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 been phenomenal. Nice. So it's a bit your ikigai, really. It's that's what you're good at, what the world needs, what you find interesting. interesting. And there's another dimension that I've, that escapes me, but... You know, it's that concept of... Yeah, completely. Yeah, purpose, the whole Japanese yeah. idea of bringing yes. those things together to make yeah. you be successful at something. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So um, initially clinical practice in a veterinary setting. Um, was there a particular eureka moment that you had that you thought, let's, you know, go from clinical practice into commercialization or development? Yeah, I mean, I, I so I worked in clinical practice um, for three or four years when I graduated and... Um, I guess what I found was that you start to get into doing a lot of the same sorts of things mm -hmm. and it becomes quite routine. And at that stage I was um, flatting with a woman that was um, in marketing working for Cadbury's and, you know, I was working like super hard, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week and she was working like 40 hours a day. Uh, week and just having an awesome time mm. and I think gosh you know is there something different that I could do here where I could kind of use the skills and experience that I've got but you know maybe be involved in a different type of business and that sort of drew me into the med tech um, business so I worked for Baxter here in New Zealand for yep. a, a few years and that kind of got me started really on you know working in industry yes. um, and I enjoyed it it was just super interesting learning new things and I kind of liked the idea of um, you know, a combination of innovation but then mm. also you know the commercial side of that and learning learning about that. Yeah it's, it's quite interesting the the mm -hmm. The divergence between people. Some people love the the mastery side of things, doing the same thing over and over again, getting better and better at that specific thing. And then, when, personally, I can't stand that. I get very <laughs> bored very quickly. Which is probably why I'm working a day job, doing a podcast, raising a daughter, and all that kind of jazz. But um, but there on the other side, there are there is there's so much out there that there's so many different dimensions that you can explore, and you you can you know work forever and never learn at all, and that. That's quite exciting to a lot of people as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of naturally curious and I like to be stimulated by new things. And I think that really piqued my interest. And I think, you know, coming, the great thing about, um, you know, veterinary education is that you learn, you've got a really broad base of knowledge, mm. but you're really a master of none of that. Right. You know, unless you do go quite narrow and deep. So it kind of gave me a base, I guess, from which then I could kind of use at least I had an understanding mm. of the kind of, you know, the breadth of the field. And it's been helpful. I mean, I found that's actually been helpful to kind of get me into, you know, different areas of, um, you know, medtech. Yeah. So Baxter was like your first foray into yep. industry and the, yep. the commercial world. Um, was there any, 
um, and then you pivoted and you started another company prior to RO, right? Is yeah, I've been in a few things. things. So yeah. I've done, I've been involved in three or four private companies. So, um, you know, I've, I started a company in um, selling uh, uh, vertical solutions to veterinary practices um, for management. I've been involved in, I've owned a couple of vet practices run an online business for a period of time. So <laughs> I've dabbled, you know, I've kind of dabbled in quite a few things, which has been interesting. I mean, none of them, obviously not been so full on into them like the role I'm in now, sure. but, um, you know, they've been helpful in terms of learning. Yeah, yeah it's adding different skill sets yeah, yeah, to, completely. Pro to provide you with the complement necessary to run these That's <laughs> more intense endeavours. Exactly, yeah. 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 So prior to Aroa, <laughs> is it Mesynthes? Is that how you Yeah, so Mesynthes was... Um, it was just a renaming of the same business. So right. we were Mesynthes and then we became Aroa. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was the same business. Yeah, great. So why don't we, yeah, let's talk about Aroa. I mean, that's yeah. why you're here really. So um, what is the, from a high level, what is the fundamental solution you're trying to, you're, you are providing here with your platform, the ECM? Yeah, platform? so what we're doing is we're, um, improving the ability of wounds and soft tissue to regenerate um, in the human body. And so our technology is essentially a um, scaffold or a template for new soft tissue regeneration. So mm. rather than the body having to start from zero and build um, new tissue, we're providing an implant that actually gets you 50-60% of the way along that healing pathway so it's all the infrastructure the biological signals yep. that allow cells to move into that um, deficit mm -hmm. and start to build new tissue that's incredible so i imagine yeah wound healing and repair very expensive should we say yeah um yeah energetically or tissue wise yep. or um, for the body to actually do so it's a it's a Kickstart along the way, a head start for the body to. That's it, and and you know, so there's a you know there's a couple of areas where it's super challenging for patients to heal. So mm -hmm. particularly as people get older, or if they have other disease states. So if they have diabetes, if they have um, vascular disease, then their um, ability to heal is very impaired. And some of these patients, their wounds never heal. Mm -hmm. And so what this does is it provides a real springboard for getting that healing response going yeah. um, and shortcutting that process so you can actually close these wounds. So you, you've got those sorts of wounds on one side where you've got um, patients that are just difficult to heal. And the other side, you've got um, patients that have lost an enormous amount of tissue mm. and um, that tissue needs to be re rebuilt. They may be healthy, but the scale of tissue loss is really high. So examples of that, of that would be something like um, trauma, Right. Um, where, where tissue has been resected in um, tumour surgery. Yep. And so you've got to rebuild that tissue really quickly. So you have sort of different use cases, and the technology mm. that we have you know, is relevant across all of those different use cases. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's like a universal solution almost, because the, the biological signals <coughs> for wound healing and, and repair are more or less universal. So if you yeah. can have a consistent framework, maybe add in a few things or take away a few things or maybe tweak things, you've got a range of products from which you can develop from the platform is that's that? a, that's yeah. exactly it. So the, the underlying technology is yeah. the same, yeah. and then what we do is we look at each of the different um, types of healing um, or conditions that the patient has, and what they need in those um, different situations is quite different. Mm -hmm. And so then we design the products specifically for that situation. So kind of an example would be um, in di you know, diabetic foot ulcers. Um, you know, to to heal those those products, to heal those patients, um, the product's relatively straightforward. It's kind of like the um, the platform technology. Whereas if I look at mm -hmm. something like hernia, mm -hmm. um, where you're repairing the abdominal wall, you need to reinforce that with synthetic fibres to kind of allow for or to to meet the load bearing requirements oh, within that application. Right. So yeah. our products are kind of engineered, I guess, for specific indication so that they kind of meet the needs of that um, particular problem right and what, what is the platform what are these products made out of in my mind you know you're kind of like 3d printing a mm. bunch of different biological tissues into a framework and then adding other spicy things to the mix but i mean it's not like that yeah that's completely <laughs> the opposite of that so what we do is we isolate a very specific layer of tissue um, from the full stomach of sheep so it's a 
it's a byproduct of um, the New Zealand meat industry. Mm. And so we isolate that tissue and then what we do is we process it in a way that we um, extract from it the components that the human body would react against, but we conserve within it the structure of that framework mm -hmm. um, and also um, important biological signals that um, attract cells into the tissue um, and also um, encourage them to divide and um, generate new tissue. So it's kind of a mixture. You end up with this um, framework that's a mixture of structure mm -hmm. uh, and also biology that encourages healing. And what's special about um, sheep and also the fore stomach of a sheep for this? Yeah, so the, the, the key, what's really different about this um, technology is the, the the structure of it and so the structure of it is very porous and so what that means is that it's very easy for cells to migrate in there and start um, you know get in there and start to generate new tissue it's also very um, rich in um, the biological components that sit in there so the the, the key is having a great uh, source material, and I think we've got lucky with that. Right. You know, our, 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 our material just seems to be the kinetics of um, developing tissue are very, very fast. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of it is the process. So processing in a way where you take away all the bad stuff, yep. but you keep the good stuff. And that's a that's a tricky thing. And, and really the product ends up being a combination of that um, what you start with and then how you process it yeah. so you end up with something that, um, that that really works. That's incredible. So potentially could you use other source materials aside from a sheep? Force yeah, oh, you can. You know, So yeah. there are other, um, other biological materials that have been used um, for these types of products, mm -hmm. um, but they all, they all have sort of different structures and different levels of biology. Yeah. You know, if we look at, um, if you were to look at, what's optimal mm. you know we think the aro ecm is the yeah. optimal uh, material just because of it has this unique combination um, of biology and structure yeah so by when you say you're taking out everything that the body will react to so that's anything that the immune, the immune system would go yeah. hang on that's yeah. foreign that's what's that doing in the body yeah, completely. Get rid of it. yeah yeah and yeah. Then yeah that's it and so over. you know all of the cells cell walls dna mm. we're, we're 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 extracting that mm. um, but we're also the other thing the body will react to is if you damage the proteins in the processing of it and the shape of those change or yep. the length of those change, then they'll see that as being um, abnormal as well. Mm -hmm. So we're very careful to um, maintain that structure and not damage the proteins that are in there as we're processing it. Must be such a delicate dance between you know getting what getting the bad out and keeping the good in. It is, you know, and it's, it's a huge optimization yeah. exercise. Yeah. yeah, so we've spent, you know, we invested in the first four or five years, we invested a huge amount of time in getting that right um, and, you know, sort of perfecting the process. And I think that's a lot of the know how that's in the, you know, that sits within the company has been getting that process um, to work properly. Yeah. So you can, you've got different products for different solutions or different problems that you're solving. Yes. So the diabetic ulcer or the topical, mm. like, Yep. skin wounds, yep. then you've got post-surgical settings, so the hernia repair, yep. Yep. slightly different framework. Yep. Um, I, I saw another product of yours that's used in um, after mastectomy as, as yep. well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so what we've done is we've sort of built, the, built out a portfolio of products. So we started with the simplest thing, which was just a sheet of the material, and then we've kind of you know, mm -hmm. engineered that into a whole range of different things. In a lot of the surgeries that we're um, involved with, where our products are being used, um, in soft tissue reconstruction, what they're often doing is, particularly um, uh, internal surgery, is they're pulling apart a lot of tissue mm. to get down to the surgical site. And what that leads to is, um, after the surgery, that those where the tissue's been separated, it's prone to... Um, filling up with fluid, so you know, getting seromas and hematomas, mm -hmm. which can lead to um, downstream complications. So what we've done is we've developed a new new product, uh, and it's a combination of our implant device um, and an external piece of hardware, which is a small disposable negative pressure pump, mm. and we've connected the two things together. So essentially, what it does is it um, delivers a vacuum 
into deep tissue. And it really, um, and if you can imagine a, um, a cavity and if you um, deliver a vacuum to it, what's this, what it's essentially doing is drawing the tissue planes together uh, and holding them together so that they can heal, yeah. but also removing the cavity. Mm. So it's a little bit like putting a... Um, putting a plastic bag on the end of a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, you yeah. know, it just sort of closes everything down, holds it all tightly together, yeah. doesn't allow any fluid to accumulate, and then um, yeah. then holds the tissue there. So in things like mastectomy, what, what you find in mastectomy is um, it's quite common for women to have seroma um, mm -hmm. after mastectomy surgery, and, you know, that can lead to complications with healing at the wound site, but also it can, can delay um, radiotherapy. You know, because you know, the, because the tissue hasn't healed, then they're not able to take them for radiotherapy. Yep. Um, so this is a kind of a way of helping to improve the healing, but also get them to that next stage of therapy as well. Yeah, that's remarkable. So yeah, pulling them together and then they oops, stick together by um, hydrostatic pressure or well, whatever. The, or the, 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 so what we're doing is we're continuing yeah. to deliver that vacuum over fourteen days. Oh, okay. So it's I holding see, yeah. it there for long enough so that it can heal. Yeah, and yeah. after fourteen days, they've, they've knitted themselves together enough. That's right. That and our implant just because it's made of our our ECM material, it just turns yeah. into tissue over time. Um, the remarkable. little catheter that's there, we just withdraw that, yep. and you know we're good to go. Away you go. <clears throat> That's amazing. Mm. Um, so why don't we talk about the, the commercialization journey, so taking these ideas into the, the patient and then into the market. Um, looking back over the last, what is it, 20 years now, 2004? Uh, 15, feels like 30. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 years of RL biosurgery. Yeah. Um, what have been like the, the biggest challenges? And I'm kind of calling this out because it's un- Unusual is probably not the right word, but it's uncommon to have this level of success in the biotechnology space from New Zealand. Mm. And doing such commercialization <coughs> from New Zealand does pose its own set of set of challenges yeah. by virtue of you know population and access to capital or mm. human capital even. But from your experience, what has been the main roadblocks or the main challenges that you've had to overcome in this journey? Yeah, I mean, I think you have it in almost in every business function that you're working in. And so these companies, like typically you kind of grow up, you start with development and then mm. once you've developed a product, you've got to work out how to figure out how to make it and then get it kind of, then get the data together to be able to get it cleared by a regulatory body and then commercialise it. So I think there's... Like there's a grenade coming across the wall for all of those things. <laughs> it's sort of hard, right? So yeah. I think, uh, you know, if I sort of, sort, of <coughs> sort of think about it, I think, um, you know, number one, funding it, you know, getting adequate um, funding to get to the next milestone to be able to raise enough money to keep mm. going. Mm. <coughs> you know, that's been challenging. When I started the company in 2008, um, the first round of funding was about one and a half million dollars, and that came in um, three tra three tranches of right. five hundred thousand. Yeah. So, and then the GFC came along, right? And so we had you know a nuclear winter for about three years. Yeah. So it was brutal. You know that kind of um, situation where you're working really hard to um, hit a milestone to get something done. Um, but you know you're doing it on you know fumes of money. That was <laughs> that that was kind of tough. Uh, yeah. And you know I think at that stage there really wasn't we didn't have the um, same uh, private money that you'd see today um, mm. in, in, in in the sector. So you know running out of money chronically is is tough. And you know particularly because you're employing people. And you're asking people to come on this journey with you, mm -hmm. and you've got about three months of you know cash <laughs> runway, yeah. and you're just trying to keep everyone going on that. So that's that's challenging. Um, I think you know <clears throat> all of these things. There's huge amounts of uncertainty. So you know when I raised the first round of funding, um, you know it was an idea and with a little bit of data behind it, but it was never a product. And so yeah. then there was a game plan about how do we get from what I started with to something that was actually a product and then how do we manufacture it. And so all of those things have been super tricky. Um, I think probably one of the hardest things was um, finding the first partner to sell, you know, our first product. And so, you know, 
things like research and develop and manufacturing, they're all internal mm -hmm. and you can kind of control them to some extent. You know, when you're going to find a partner, you're talking about someone outside your organisation that doesn't really care about you necessarily and you've got to go and find someone to be able to take this product and sell it yeah. um, internationally for you. So that was that was super challenging. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, just getting going, you know, actually developing, you know, starting to develop all the kind of um, infrastructure that you need to run a vertically integrated you know, company is a lot. So you kind of take it on yeah. in little chunks. And I think the good thing is you don't, um, you don't look too far down the line. Yeah. You know, you look at what's the next, what's the next milestone, what's the next thing we've got to get done, and you kind of build it yeah. in stages along the way. I mean, I'm sure at the beginning you could you could make your self insane by looking at how tall the, the mountain is that you're going to have to climb over the next 15, 20 years. Pretty much. Or yeah. how big the elephant yeah. is that you have to consume. But it's just one step at a time, one bite at a time. Yeah, well, it's good. I think naive, naive, naivety and delusion are two helpful things <laughs> as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, you don't realize you don't realize it until you're in it. You know, so uh, yeah. that sort of unfolds in front of you. Yeah. Here's a quick message from today's sponsor, Sapro, your clinical trial pathway partner. Engaging with Sapro as your clinical trial pathway partner will keep you and your collaborators on track, ensuring your strategic objectives are met and that your product is approved as soon as possible. For the small biotech or pharmaceutical company. Sapro offers tailored CRO solutions from start to finish with their reliable alliance partners. But it's interesting you mentioned kind of like the, the runway piece mm. and, and running out of money. That must be a, a perennial issue for all entrepreneurial pursuits and really <clears throat> forefront in, in biotech or medtech because mm. money doesn't go very far when you're trying to make a groundbreaking yeah. novel technology. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, money. I think money's money's a big challenge, and you know, as people, as you know, I mean, how money works is um, particularly in these sorts of companies is you don't get enough money to build the whole company, and so you, what you do, what you get is uh, an amount of money to get you to the next milestone that has some sort of commercial value mm -hmm. that will allow you to go and raise some more money. Yep. And so, you know, you're sort of leaping. It's like stepping stones. Yep. You're kind of on the stepping stone pathway, and um, you know, it's you, you to raise the money. You put together a plan, and you say, "Okay, I'm going to do all these things, and it's going to get me to that next stepping stone." And always, the plan is wrong, and <laughs> it doesn't go. It doesn't go like that, you yeah. know. And so, you've just got to have enough. Um, uh, latitude enough resilience, right, to yeah. kind of find yeah. your way to that next stepping stone, yeah. despite kind of going sideways for quite a bit of time. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so those stepping stones are typically like your your Series A, Series B, Series mm. C, and then ideally an IPO. Yeah. Uh, uh, or at the other end, you got the seed seed funding, and then. Beyond beyond the IPO, then you're a commercial company making money, and you don't have to ask for more. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the dream, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's it's sort of interesting in this part of the world because I think what you see in um, Australia, particularly, is a lot of um, uh, relatively less mature companies that have been IPO'd, and so because the venture market's been quite thin, mm. you've seen a lot of you know more immature companies um, that are listed. So. There's, you know, there's not a lot of sort of like what I call like vertically integrated AS, um, companies on the ASX. You know, we we certainly we certainly are. Um, you know, I think uh, so. The ASX kind of cohort is probably a little bit more volatile than what you'd see in terms of other parts That's of the world. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I spoke to um, uh, I had a guest on that's um, uh, economics commentator, and he, he kind of drove that point home that our capital <coughs> markets in New Zealand are very immature mm. by comparison. They're not wide, they're not deep. Yeah. Um, so it's very easy to exhaust those opportunities. <coughs> um, so that, that makes sense. That, yeah, you know, completely. That, I mean, yeah. so for us, you know, we, we IPO'd in 2020 and um, prior to that we'd um, done, you know, we didn't kind of go down the classical route of, you know, seed, series A, B, C. It was like seed, Micro round, micro round, <laughs> micro round. <laughs> Something that looked like a Series A, and then we did a pre-IPO round. Um, right. And so, 
you know, at, for the first, um, you know, 10 or so years of the company, we did, we did, we were sort of had relatively small amounts of um, funding coming in. The great thing about listing on the ASX was it just completely changed how we could think about the business. So rather than having a horizon that was, like we had a plan that was three, four years out, but our, our horizon was always six to 12 months because that's how much cash we had. Gosh, wow. But then once we listed, you know, mm. like we raised, um, you know, it's, I think it was 50 or 60, and then we came back and raised another similar, similar amount of money. So all of a sudden, we just had so much more cash yep. and we were able to think, gosh, actually, we actually have enough money to be able to plan for three years now mm. and actually go away and do that stuff. You know, so that was a that has been a complete game changer and it's changed sort of how we how we thought about doing things. Gave us a lot more certainty about getting stuff done as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of illustrates why we don't have that many biotechnology companies or pharmaceutical type companies or biotech startups, you know, um, whenever you get in the space that you require a clinical trial to demonstrate the safety and the efficacy of your product, that takes a lot of time yeah. and a lot of money. And if you yeah. have enough, if you're only getting enough to do six to 12 months before you've exhausted your, your kitty, that's, um, uh, that's just not even going to be on the cards. That's right. right. So I think, you know, and, and so when you think about that, I mean, I think it's in Australia, you'd see that, but particularly in New Zealand, it's, you know, developing, um, you know, biotech companies that need huge amounts of capital up front, I think is yeah. super challenging. Devices is different because device devices um, typically less expensive to develop. Typically, mm. um, regulatory approvals are much less onerous as well. And so you can get to a commercial product, you know, with a lot less cash and a lot shorter time frame and probably... Um, for the most part, I think the the, out, the outcomes are a lot less binary as well. You know, yeah. with a um, biotech, you know, it's sort of like yes or no, you know, yes. and then it's yeah. game over. Whereas yeah. in um, medical devices, it's like, okay, we're now commercial and, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for iterative innovation development once you once you have commercial products. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. I think there needs to be uh, – maybe we're developing this over time as well – like a New Zealand specific flavor to our innovative sector mm. in the health space that is that reflects the the limitations and also the expertise that we have here. If the limitations mm. are access to capital, then maybe, you know, not having a lot of biotech is it makes sense. Mm. But the opportunities there with medtech are, are a bit more easy to I think they are. I mean, I think, I think they are. I think they're easier. I think it's a whole different model mm. in terms of how you how you build the company. You know, because if you think about um, if, like biotech, you, you know, essentially you can build um, a company with a relatively small number of people with a lot of capital. You know, you can contract out a lot of the, what you need to do um, and you never, it's rare that someone will build a vert vertically integrated business. You know, so they'll do development, they'll do a little bit of manufacturing, yep. but then when it comes to commercialisation, typically done through a partner. Mm. You know, whereas a medtech company, you've actually got to take the product to the market, you've got to commercialise it, you've got to prove it out. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so you really have to build the whole thing. So you and your team would have done a, a raft <coughs> of clinical studies to support mm. the safety mm. and efficacy of these, particularly in the implanting, yep. implantable sense. Yep. Um, that must have been a challenge um, given the, the, the capital <laughs> access, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean. yeah, it was. So the way, the way we sort of went about that, and, you know, that was part of the deal for... Um, raising money into the company as well is that, you know, because the capital markets were thin here, we, you know, pretty early on, a big part of my job was going and finding commercial partnerships um, with other companies. And so, you know, that was for commercialization, but it was also for clinical development. Mm. And so those partners, as part of the deals that we did with them, there were commitments to studies and um, commitments to investment. Yeah. Um, in those studies and so in a way we sort of outsourced um, clinical development to our partners they did the clinical development for us and you know that was useful for the products that they had licensed but it was also useful for us in terms of validating the technology platform that yep. we could then leverage that in the future so you know Teladita has done a fantastic job in their clinical development 
Um, you know, the Bravo study's got stunning results. Um, you know, we've done a couple of um, large um, real world studies ourselves. We've got a couple mm -hmm. of RCTs under, underway at the moment. So, oh, you know, it's kind of evolved over time. I mean, early on, it was very simple stuff, mm -hmm. you know, real simple studies. And now it's obviously, um, as we've got more capacity, we're able to invest in bigger studies. Yeah. So are there any studies on the radar or going on now? I think I saw one for an V. Is it Anevo? Anevo, yeah. The, so the we're doing study? a, yeah, Anevo's um, a pilot study in mastectomy. And so we're doing 10 patients and that's just mm. a first in human study um, as, a, as a beginning to set ourselves up for a much larger study. Um, we have a study for Symphony um, running in the US. So this is our um, skin substitute product for use in diabetic foot ulcers. Um, that's a 100-patient study. Wow. Uh, it's an RCT yep. um, being run by a CRO uh, there. Yeah. And our Myriad product, um, which is really where most of our commercial focus is at the moment, um, where this year we'll, we'll do a pilot study looking at Myriad in combination um, with negative pressure wound therapy. And then that will then set us up for an RCT for that. So, yeah, the, the, the investment in clinical development is, um, is certainly increasing. But, you know, it's... That's, that, getting that data is really important, obviously, in terms of um, you know evidence to support the use of your products. Yeah, and running that study, that big hundred patient study in the US, is that part of a strategy to kind of prime the market? You've got boots on the ground there, somewhat of, of an experience with the product yeah. through the investigators that are running the trial. Is yeah, that exactly. It? So yeah. it's 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 all of those things. So um, the, these uh, you know part of it's getting early experience with the product, part of it's um, seeding that product with investigators that are very experienced in this area, um, you know, that can potentially be um, speakers for the product in the future. Mm. Um, it's getting, you know, good high quality data. It's also doing it with a CRO that is known to be very active in this area, very well respected as well. So that brings um, some weight behind the evidence as well. Yeah, definitely. You don't want some, you know, brand new kid off the block. Well, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, the these are, you know, they're people that are known <laughs> to be very active um, in investigating in this era. Yeah. Yeah. So the pilot, going back to the pilot study with mm. Nevo, so is that like a proof of concept type thing before you expand <coughs> into a larger registration type Yeah, it study? is. Yeah, so we've done, you know, we've done quite a lot of preclinical work with Nevo. So, and... The preclinical model that we have, you know, we think um, replicates the problem um, very well in terms of scale and size of the problem. So um, that sort of set us up for the first in human study. And I think we've been really pleased to see, you know, how that's tracked. Um, and so, yeah, the learning that we can sort of take away from that now sort of sets us up for, you know, now stepping into a much larger study. Yeah. Super exciting. Mm. So, um, are there any other products on the horizon? Is have you? I can't imagine that you've ex exhausted the opportunities of the platform. Well, I think the, the challenge is like what you don't do, right? Because there's there's always so many things that you yeah. could do, and I think we we're um, getting much more selective mm. in terms of you know product products that we can develop, but then also have the capacity to be able to commercialize yeah. um, and kind of are aligned with our strategy because if everything's a priority then nothing is that's it right? <laughs> that's it so so now it's like okay well yeah. we're in you know we're, we're, we've seen a lot of success with myriad and trauma and so um we have our, our sales team in the u.s is very focused on um on trauma centers mm. and so now as we think about new products it's well what else what other products make sense in that trauma setting and what complements what we're already doing. So I think there's a much stronger alignment around um, with d between development and our, our sales team and mm -hmm. how we can kind of build out that portfolio. I mean, we may, you know, we've partnered off other things in the past. So, you know, the Talibai deal, um, mm -hmm. you know, we may do that in the future, but I think it's also just making sure we've got a really awesome portfolio um, in that trauma area. Yeah. And building the company, so you've gone from, you know, a, an, an idea now through to ASX listed, mm. commercial company, myriad of products, one of which is myriad. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, over that time, how has your role 
changed and evolved? Because obviously very different approach that you would have taken with a few employees or yeah. you know, early stage development to purely fully commercial. Uh, yeah, oh, it's like it's um, it's I've got to rethink my job every year. <laughs> is kind of how it goes, you know. Right. So um, I think every year. I've sort of thought about, well, what is it that I can, I'll can i do next year that's kind of different because I've got good people doing these things now and what's the next thing that we need to get good at or what's the big change that we have to make to mm. to take things to, to where we want to go. So I've tried to be really purposeful about pulling back from some things and doing um, more of other things. So at the beginning it was like raising money, finding a partner and then just kind of keeping on top of operationally everything we're doing. I mean, now we're many parts of our business are, are really mature and I've got awesome people that are running those things that there's not a lot of value that I can add to that, but there's some other things I can, you know. So I try and kind of focus on areas where it's some, something that we're going to do in the future so, or, or what tends to happen, and I think this is the same for all senior people is that all the problems end up on your desk you know so it's some of the problems that you've got to fix as well that kind of you're the person that's got to kind of make a call on it or yep. you know the, you get a few of those things as well yeah I, I can imagine that appointing the right people in those important leadership positions whether mm. it be departmentally or even above that cross-functionally is going to be critical to you know, you can't make all the decisions. No. You can't delegate to yeah. everyone, but yeah. you can delegate to a few lieutenants or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. But getting those right could make or break <laughs> an endeavor. Yeah, well, I think that's just, uh, right through building a company. That is so important. And you have mixed success. You know, like sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. And if you get it right, it makes a huge difference. And if you get it wrong, it makes a huge difference as well. You know, so it's kind of... Get it, building the team and getting the right people is, is I think, it's a super important part of the job and, um, uh, you know, hugely important in terms of success. Yeah, how have you found um, securing the right human capital or, like, employing well-equipped, well-trained, well-experienced people in New Zealand? A lot of the people that I've had on the podcast have said mm. that's a, that can be difficult and yeah. by virtue of us being in New Zealand, attracting international talent can be difficult as well because we yeah. can't meet the salary expectations, say, yep. of someone from the US. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I think it's been challenging for sure. We've done okay. You know, I think we, um, at the end of the day, you know, you can kind of whinge about it or just get on, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think I've sort of taken the opportunity, I've just taken the attitude that I can get people that uh good enough that if we, you know, they may, you know, every, no one's perfect at anything, right? So um, you get some people that have got good capacity, good experience, you get people that are smart, fast learners, eager, mm. that'll carry them a huge way. And I've, you know, I've found um, good technical capability here. As we've got bigger, we've certainly had an ability to attract international people. And yep. um, that's helped. Bringing in international people with with key skills is then we've been able to um, use their skills and experience and disseminate that through other groups, and then those other people have been able to kind of yes. learn and get capable. So, I think attitude carries you a huge a huge way, and you know we've got a lot of young people that are just super keen mm. and really capable, and you know with you know I've found within two or three years those people can be phenomenal. Yeah. Have you have you heard of the Pareto principle sure. distribution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, have you yeah. have you f seen that within? Oh yeah, I think videos? it's everything. Is yeah. it's Pareto principle, <laughs> right? Like so, eighty twenty. It's yeah. like yeah, you, know, you know, it's only twenty percent of is it like twenty percent of things matter for eighty percent of the impact or something? Yeah, or eighty percent of the work is done by twenty percent of yeah, the people. You know? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that's uh, a, universal. It's, it's kind of is. I think that's how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah, got a few champions yeah. that really that move make a the, difference. Move the yeah, needle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get that right. Then yeah, you're away. it's the same. I mean, it's the same when you look at the things that you focus on and what makes you successful. There's not a lot of things, you know. There's lots of noise, yep. but there's only a few things that really matter. Yeah. I've got a random question for you, Brian. Yes. But do you have an internal monologue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I don't know, not a recurring one, but no, yeah, because no, yeah. I've had this discussion with a few people. Yeah. I don't. Okay, mm. I don't have an internal monologue at all. Yeah, I whereas my my wife, she has a very active, almost to the point that it's a dialogue. You know, it's a yeah, a, 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 her thoughts she can hear almost audibly, and it's a bit like a conversation. Um, whereas for me, it's almost like radio silence up in here. It's just a abstract. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, when I think about Aroa and the way I think about that, I mean, I, I don't know if I'd call it an internal monologue, but what I, what I would say is, like, I'm in, I'm, um, I'm very, very determined to, to build a successful company. And I think, you know, that... Um, you know that 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 has you know driven I guess a lot of kind of things that we've done. So I don't I don't want I don't, you know I'm going to make it work. You know it's kind of and that's how I think about it. Well, shit, there's a problem. Mm. We've got to fix the problem, but we're not. That is not going to um, prevent this from being a very successful company. And I think a lot of um, a, you know a lot of finding your way through problems is essentially determination. Mm. You know, obviously you've got to throw ideas into the mix and stuff like that, but I think in ha having the um, the confidence and the fortitude, you know, and the willingness to um, go through what it takes to make it successful, I think you just end up there. It's kind of like yeah. it sort of becomes yeah. self-fulfilling in a way. Yeah. Yeah, you like wrestle it into being yeah, you just kind by of sheer do. You kind of, I think you kind of do, and I've seen that with other people. I mean, with other companies, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of, I think, in, you know, life science is a classic example. There's so many companies that um, it's almost like a game of the last man standing. You know, <laughs> it kind of is because game of like, attrition. It's a game of attrition because in the end, what you find up, find out if you have enough smart people in the room, you'll figure it out and you'll be okay. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, there's heaps of you know biotech companies where they were down to the last experiment or down to the last uh, candidate that they had, and all of a sudden that one worked. And you look yeah. at there was just a, a, a complete war zone of failure, and then there, then all of a sudden they're heroes, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of I think it's how it rolls, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean the, the time scale might change, but yeah. the story is true, right? Yeah, you just keep, yeah. keep at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and how has, from your perspective over these 15 years, mm. you, you, you mentioned the, the GFC and the, the post-GFC nuclear winter yeah. and a whole bunch of companies kind yeah. of just up and left with the, the, mm. the global. Um, but how has the ecosystem for biotech, medtech, health tech, whatever you want to call it, yeah. changed over, over the last 15 years from your perspective? I think it's dramatically different. Like I look at... Um, you know, if I'm sort of thinking about both, well, both Australia and New Zealand, there's, um, you know, until probably recently, there's been a lot more um, capital in the market. A lot of, you know, um, you know, good venture, you know, good venture rounds being done. So, mm -hmm. you know, seeing companies, you know, do initial seed rounds like five, ten million dollars, which is huge. You know, so having that amount of capital is phenomenal. You've seen you know, good follow-on financings as well. So, you know, companies being able to find their way through to quite decent rounds that gives them the ability to fund. Yeah. Um, you've had, you know, I think there's a, there's more capability and talent mm. um, as well. So people that have had experience, whether it be um, in companies in this part of the world or in companies in other parts of the world. So it's, it's a lot more mature. It's a lot more organised. You know, those where those, you know, you, you see... You know, syndication of deals and stuff like that. So yeah. that's that's a lot more straightforward. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit a lot more mature overall, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think so. so. I mean, also think, um, you know, I probably have thought this for a while, but you know, the whole, you know, I think there's a lot more evidence now globally that these companies can kind of spring up anywhere, <laughs> and therefore um, people a little bit less. Well, but a bit more agnostic in terms of location, you know. So, um, you know, a company like us um, developing in New Zealand is, um, you know, that doesn't seem too crazy now. You know, whereas you know, ten years ago that was was a bit crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's interesting. I've heard ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it's like, oh, that's just farming, right? Just yeah, sheep. That's a, I mean, I yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what a um, 
uh, a guest say to me, he said, for the longest time, New Zealand has been a housing market with an economy attached to it. Yes, <laughs> so <it's> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that hasn't really changed. It's still, still yeah. kind of is, isn't it? Mm. Um, that's super. So, I mean, for me, this all the the conversation that I'm having, this one included, mm. it's all pointing to signs for New Zealand really being a, a ripe and fertile ground for more innovation in these areas. If there is more mature capital markets that comparatively they're still quite immature yeah. to the US, but they are more mature than they used to be, so there are more options, and options drive productivity. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, yep. it's quite yeah. encouraging. So what, yeah. what advice would you give to budding health tech or biotech entrepreneurs? Uh, you know, I think um, do it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. You know, I think, yeah, just do it. I mean, I think I think uh, it's, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world, isn't it, to kind of think about not doing it or make excuses or whatever. Right. I think it's, um, I think it's you know, for me, um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I sort of came into this role having worked for a bunch of large companies and, um you know, you go into something that's hugely uncertain, you know, and uh, quite scary in a way, but also um, enormously satisfying and, you know, a lot of fun. And, you know, it's it's a, it's a um, great opportunity to get to build something, mm. you know, and I think that's uh, hard to replicate, you know. So I think, um, it, you know, it's... You know, if you are interested in starting a company, part, the biggest challenge is getting started. I think you know, it's getting the, um, you, you know, taking the leap of faith mm -hmm. is, is is probably the hardest thing because then once you get started, you're sort of in this situation where you're just sort of in this free fall and you've got to make it work. <laughs> you know, so you kind of need to you kind of get to that situation quickly yeah. and you get started and you kind of figure it out from there. Yeah. And I think that's um you know, if people are interested, I mean, in that sort of um uh career path, I think, you know, I would have done it younger, you know, maybe maybe I would have done you done it younger if I had the opportunity to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your time. Mm. This has been mm. a fantastic conversation. If people want to find out more about yourself or RO Biosurgery, where can they go? Yes, they can go to our website. Um, we also have a LinkedIn account um, and, um, you know, tin, the TIN report, there's mm -hmm. information on us there. So there's a number of sources of information um, on RO. Awesome. We'll mm. be watching closely, um, see the next developments. And thanks again. Great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Yes.